Hello everybody. Welcome to day one of Recursion. Uh, if you've not encountered Recursion before, it will definitely expand your mind. Um, I usually start by asking students, do they already know about Recursion? And if you think you do know about Recursion already, or if you ask another programmer, they will always tell you the exact same thing. And what I'm about to tell you is that that's not very helpful. So if you ask somebody, what is Recursion? Here's what they'll tell you. They'll tell you a recursive method is a method that calls itself. Um, and that's not wrong, that's true, um, but it doesn't really tell you anything about why would you want to do that? Why, like, why is recursion helpful? What's it really about? So I have a different version of what recursion is about. Recursion is a specific way of thinking about problem solving um, that's very well suited to particular kinds of problems that will make solutions really short and really simple. Um, so there's a type of problem solving strategy called divide and conquer. And the way it works is if you have a big problem, you divide it into smaller pieces called sub problems. And then you have different approaches to solving those sub, sub problems. And then once you have the solutions to the sub problems, you put them together to solve your original problem. So recursion is a special kind of divide and conquer technique. It's a technique that can be used whenever you can divide your problem into smaller copies of the same kind of problem. So here's uh, an immediate example. Let's say we want to know how to find the maximum value in an array. Um, so if I asked you how to do this, like we learned this in week one, you would just loop over the array one thing at a time. You'd compare each thing to the largest so far until you eventually found the largest. Here's how you would think about it using divide and conquer. Let's break the list in half. Let's find the largest thing in the left half. Let's find the largest thing in the right half. And then let's compare to see which of those two largest things is bigger. And that must be the largest thing for the whole list. So see how I didn't think about the problem in terms of looping over things one by one. I thought about it as let's break it into two smaller pieces. And then let's solve the same kind of problem for the smaller pieces. Because the original problem was find the maximum. Here I'm also saying find the maximum, but for sub parts of the list. Okay, well you might be thinking, how do I find the maximum for the smaller sub part of the list? And the answer is, you can divide and conquer again. So if I have a list size four, let's break it into lists that are size two. And I'll return the maximum of those two, the maximum of those two. This is going to figure out which of those two is bigger, 29 or 15. And so it returns 29. In the right hand, I'll divide it in half and in half, which is larger, 32 or 10? Oh, 32. And then it'll return 32, and then I compare 32 and 29. So this is a kind of illustration of the idea. This is the way, this is the type of thinking that you're about to practice for the next uh, about week. Instead of thinking about problem solving as like, what's the first step, what's the second step, what's the third step? You're not trying to think about steps that will lead you to the answer. Instead, you're trying to think about it this way. Assume that you could magically get solutions to smaller versions of the same problem. How would you use those solutions to make the solution to the problem you're actually trying to solve? So again, here, if the problem we're trying to solve is find the largest value in eight numbers, let's say we could magically find the largest value in four numbers and then magically find the largest value in four numbers. Well, that would make the problem easy because then we just have to compare those two largest values. That's the essence of the problem solving technique. So let's dive in with the first classic example that everybody always learns when they learn about recursion. If you've not seen these before, these are called the Fibonacci numbers. So um, it's a sequence that starts out with the numbers one and then one and then two and then three and then five. And you might be noticing that one plus one is two and one plus two is three, and two plus three is five, and three plus five gives you the next number, which is eight. And in general, if I want the nth Fibonacci number, I can get it by adding together the n minus second and the n minus first to get the nth. So notice that this is an example of breaking a problem into smaller problems of the same type. We wanna know, let's pretend we wanna know the uh, 87th Fibonacci number. We don't know what that is, so let's break it into two smaller examples of the same kind of problem. Uh, the 87th Fibonacci number is the same as the 85th Fibonacci number plus the 86th Fibonacci number. 
So if I could magically know the answers to these, whoops, if I could magically know the answer to these smaller Fibonacci numbers, that would give me the answer to the larger one. So I'm going to write something that is almost a completely working actual Java solution to finding Fibonacci numbers. Um, the method we're writing is called fib. If you're wondering what long is about, long is just a large integer. Um, long is like int, except uh, it involves twice as much memory, and so you can store integers that are much, much, much larger. Okay, so what did I just say? I just said that uh, the nth Fibonacci number is like the n minus second Fibonacci number plus the n minus first Fibonacci number. So I said, let's pretend we can magically get smaller answers to smaller versions of the same problem. The way we're going to magically get our answers is we're going to run our own method. Um, sorry, I should have written fib here. So hmm, here, hold on. Okay, there we go. Um, so if we want to know, so let's say, let's say again, n is 87. If we run fib with an input of 87, the way we're going to figure out what that 87th Fibonacci number is, is we're going to magically solve for the 85th Fibonacci number by running our own method with a smaller input. So this is called the recursive leap of faith. We are just going to believe that the method that we're writing right now is going to give us correct answers for inputs that are smaller than n. Um, why are you allowed to do this? That We'll get to that in a second. That's this tree diagram. Um, but ignore the tree diagram for the moment. So like I said, this is almost a completely working solution that will give us Fibonacci numbers. Um, the only problem is that it might seem like this is going to go into an infinite loop. Like let's pretend I run Fibonacci with an input of 4. That's going to immediately run Fibonacci with an input of uh, 2, because that's 2 less than 4. That's immediately going to run Fibonacci with an input of 0. That's immediately going to run Fibonacci with an input of negative 2, which is going to run Fibonacci with an input of negative 4, and so on. So it seems like that's just going to loop forever, and that's right. Um, that's called an infinite recursion, um, and usually that's bad. Well, that's basically always bad. Um, so let's add the one thing that we're missing. <clears throat> this is called the recursive case. The thing that we're missing is the second half of a solution called the base case. <clears throat> What's the difference between a recursive case and a base case? <clears throat> the recursive case is an input that's big enough that you would need to break it into smaller pieces to find the answer. The base case is an input that's so small or so simple that you can give an answer right away without any further calculation. Um, so let's decide, let's decide what these numbers are in the sequence. So I'm going to call this the zeroth term, the first term, the second term, the third term, and so on. <clears throat> so if I said, uh, what's fib of 87? You would say, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's fib of 85 plus fib of 86, but we don't know what that is. So fib of 87, that's too big. So we have to break it into smaller examples, and that's the recursive case. If I said fib of 8, that's also too big. I'd have to break it into smaller Fibonacci numbers and add them together. If I said, what is fib of 0? That's one that's so small, I know it right away. No uh, breaking into pieces required. And in fact, if you think about the first two Fibonacci numbers, I can't define them in terms of smaller ones. Um, because the, the whole chain has to start off somewhere, and this is where it starts off. So the base case, in this case, there would be two of them. It would be, what if n is 0, whoops, n equals 0, um, or n equals 1. And in either of those cases, I'm going to return the number 1. So this is now a completely working version uh, of a method that calculates Fibonacci numbers. And just to prove it, um, I think it's worthwhile for you to jump on the laptop and give it a try. I will do that also. OK, here we go. So I'm going to print out fib. Let's do the 13th Fibonacci number. Let's create the method. It doesn't return Boolean. It's going to return long. I'll make the input long as well. I'll call it n. So I'm just going to type exactly what we had. So the base case was n equals 0 or n equals 1. And in either of those cases, the answer is 1. Um, that's the base case. The recursive case would be return fib of n minus 1 
plus fib of n minus 2. <coughs> okay. So that's it. Let's run it. All right. It says 377. I don't actually know if that's correct or not. So rather than a single print statement, let's do this. Let's make a loop that loops from 0 up to, I don't know, 26. And I'm going to print out the loop number, and then a colon, and then fib of that number. So this is going to print sort of like a data table of the Fibonacci numbers. And that should let us hand check it as they go up. All right, so 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. So those seem to be working. And the 25th Fibonacci number is that. And if we wanted to, we could hand check that those two add to be this one. Um, but I have faith based on the earlier examples in the table. All right, so that's it. It's, a, it's two lines of code that calculate Fibonacci numbers. And at this point, first block sort of didn't believe it. They thought maybe something mystical is happening. There's some kind of library that already knows about the Fibonacci numbers. And the answer is no. This, this method, we wrote it for the first time. The computer doesn't automatically know about Fibonacci numbers. So let's, let's understand how the magic happens. OK, let's figure it out. So I have slightly rewritten this so that the n minus 1 call happens first. And I've added some line numbers. Let's trace carefully what happens step by step when we run uh, fib with an input of 3. So we're going to be here. So whenever you are running a method that then calls another method, um, when that method gets to its return statement, it returns back to where it was originally called from. So how does it remember where it came from? The answer is there's a part of memory called the stack whose job it is to keep track of that sort of thing. So whenever you invoke a new method, um, a, new, a new portion gets added to the stack, which remembers where we came from. It records what method is being run right now. It records the value of the parameters, um, things like that. And each of those is called a stack frame. So let's pretend we're going to run fib with an input of 3. And so that creates a new stack frame. All right, so here we are. Um, I'm going to call this stack frame 0, element 0. The input value is 3. Um, once it's done running, it's going to return to we don't know where because I'm not running this from a main. But if this was being run from a main method, it would be whatever stack frame corresponds to the main method on a particular line. OK, so we are currently here. So when n equals 3, we run, we run this first line. And we ask, do we hit the base case? In other words, if, is this if statement true? And the answer is no. So we move to the second line. And we're going to run, we're going to invoke fib again. When we invoke fib a second time, it's going to create a copy of this method, sort of. Um, and that's going to make a new stack frame. So let's see what that looks like. OK, so we ran fib with an input of 3. We got to line 2 here. That ran fib with an input of 2. And so now this is another version of fib that's running with an input of 2. But it knows that once it's done, it's going to return to stack frame 0 up here on line 2, which is right here. So that's where it got called from. OK, so now we're running f of 2. Do we hit the base case? The answer is no, because n is 2, and so it's not 0 or 1. And so now we move down to the next line. And that's going to run another copy of fib. Only this time, it's going to be n minus 1. And we're using our own copy of n. So it's going to run fib of 1. <clears throat> so here we are, running fib again with an input of 1. And we know that when this one's done, it's going to go back to where it came from, which is uh, frame stack 1, uh, stack frame 1 on line 2. Stack frame run line 2. OK, so. Uh, do we hit the base case? Aha! <clears throat> now we do, because the input was 1. And so we're going to return 1. So this is going to exit, and we're going to go back to where we came from, frame 1, line 2, which was here. Only now a has a value. <clears throat> and so now we're going to continue running this version. So we finished running line 2, so now we're going to run line 3. Whoa. There you go, finger. Um, and that's going to create its own stack frame. Only this time we're going to run it with n minus 2. Since n started at 2, that's going to run fib 0. 
So here we are running fib with an input of zero. It's gonna to return to stack frame one on line three because now it's the second call. We hit the base case immediately because n equals zero. So we're right away gonna return one. So now we've finished running line two. We've finished running line three. So now we're gonna run line four, which is going to return two. Where is it gonna return back to? It's gonna return back to stack frame zero on line two. Now, finally, we finished running line two from our original call of fib three. And so now we're gonna run line three, which is gonna run fib of three minus one, uh, sorry, three minus two is one. So line three is gonna run fib one. <clears throat> All right, we hit the base case immediately because n equals one, so we're gonna return one. And now we're almost done. We've finished line two, we finished line three, so now we're gonna return a plus b which is two plus one, and so that returns the answer of three. Okay, so I wanted to illustrate what happens step by step. Um, it's maybe easier to visualize what's happening using this tree. We were just looking at this part of the tree. So we said, what happens if you want run fib three? What we did was we ran fib two, and fib two ran fib one. Fib one right away returned the value one. And so then we were back at the next line of fib two. It ran fib zero, which immediately returned one. <coughs> Once we'd executed lines two and three from fib two, it returns two. But where it returned back to was our original call to fib three. Then line two for our original call was complete. And so we ran line three, which ran fib one. And fib one immediately returned one. And then fib three, returns three. So that's, uh, so I just replayed again what we just did with the stack frames, only this time we're visualizing the execution as a tree. If I'd run fib four, the very first thing that would have happened is I would have run fib three, which would have done all that. And then I would have run fib two, which itself would have invoked a tree. So these tree structures are helpful in visualizing how does the method run itself over and over and over again as it's taking its original input and breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces? Okay, flip over to the backside. <coughs> we'll do another example, factorial. So if you are unfamiliar with factorial, that exclamation mark is a factorial symbol. And for positive integers, we'll define factorial as a falling set of multiplications. So 10 factorial will be 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 all the way down to 1. Okay, so if I asked you to program a method to calculate factorials before today, you would have said, well, let's make a for loop, maybe that loops from one to 10, and each time I loop, I'll multiply something by the next loop counter, and that would work. But remember, we're practicing a certain way of thinking. We're, practice, we're practicing asking, how can you calculate 10 factorial in terms of the answer to a smaller version of the same problem? In other words, how can I calculate 10 factorial in terms of the answer to a smaller factorial? <laughs> Woo! So let's imagine a very large factorial. Let's say we're gonna do 1,089 factorial. <clears throat> if you pause it for a second and see if you can think about that. Uh, in the other blocks, people said it was 1,089 times 1,088 factorial. So here I have this unknown number. I'm gonna calculate it as whatever that number is times a factorial that's one smaller. So I've defined my solution in terms of a smaller solution. How do you figure out that one? Well, that one's gonna be 1,088 times 1,087 factorial. How do you figure out that one? That one's gonna be, and that's what the recursion is gonna do. The recursion is gonna run itself over and over again on smaller and smaller copies of the problem. Okay, so in general, n factorial should be n times n minus one factorial. Um, so take a minute and try and fill in the blank. Actually, why don't you do it on the left side? So you try to fill it in on the left side and then we'll take a look on the right side. So try and give a complete working Java method that calculates factorial recursively. Okay, I'm gonna do it slightly wrong. So what I just said is n factorial is gonna be n times factorial of n minus one. Okay, so what thing am I forgetting that starts with a b? 
It's the same thing we forgot on the front page, and the, the thing that you're going to forget probably repeatedly. Um, we forgot the base case. So we have the recursive case. But the base case is going to be an input that's so small or so simple, we can just answer it right away. So we could say if n equals 1, then we'll return 1, because 1 factorial is just 1. <coughs> OK, and that should work. So go ahead and program it on the computer. Verify that it works for you on the computer. And then come back in a second. So this one's a little bit trickier. Um, the examples up till now have been numeric. It's helpful to find an example that doesn't involve numbers. So let's pretend that I want to know, is an input just a set of nested parentheses? So down here, we see, or so what does it mean to be nested? What it means to be nested <coughs> is that the opening and closing parentheses form little nests, like matryoshka dolls. Um, so here we've got two sets of nested parentheses. I'm going to define empty string as zero sets of nested parentheses, so that should also return true. Here I have, it seems like, four sets of nested parentheses. Here, you might say, oh, look, the, the parentheses are nested. What's the problem? Well, x is not a parenthesis, so it has to be only nested parentheses. So this one fails because of the x. This one fails because of the h's and i's. <coughs> this one is only parentheses, so that's good. Um, but it fails because it doesn't have a closing parenthesis here, so they're not nested. Okay, so that's the goal. The goal is, given an input, decide whether or not it is only nested parentheses. And the way you're going to do it is you're going to ask, how could I take a big input? Like, what if my input looks like this? I'm not counting here. Okay, that seems like about the same number. So are these matching? I don't know. I wasn't counting as I was doing it. It could be matching or it could be off by one. Um, if you have an, an input that's this large, could you break this into something smaller, ask if that's nested, and then use that answer to answer if the original question is nested? So before writing any code, decide what's your recursive case going to look like. How are you going to break it into a smaller size? And then how are you going to use that answer to answer your original question? OK, here's what a lot of people said. A lot of people said, first, let's check, is the first character an opening parenthesis, and is the last character a closing parenthesis? If the answer is yes, then let's get rid of them. And then let's ask about the middle. Is the middle nested? And that's the recursive call. That's where we're going to use our own method to answer the same nested question, but about a smaller input. And so when, when we run ourselves, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say, is this one opening? Is this one closing? Yes. And then we're going to run nested on the middle. And then we'll say, is this one opening? Is this one closing? And then we'll run nested on the middle. And we'll, we'll keep doing that, eliminating from both sides as we go. So there's no need to loop because the recursive call where nested runs itself is going to act as a loop because each time we call ourselves, we're making the input a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller until we reach the base case. So let's look at what this might look like on the laptop. All right, so I am going to run a method called nested on an input. Let's create the nested method. It should return a Boolean because nested is a question that could be true or false. I'm going to call the input string str. Um, let's do it in pseudocode first. So in pseudocode, I said what we wanted to do was we wanted to get the first character. Let's get the last character. And then let's get the middle. And then once we have those, we'll say if first isn't in opening parentheses, or if last isn't a closing parenthesis, then we'll return false. Because we know that it couldn't possibly be nested. Otherwise, if uh, the middle is nested, we'll return true. Otherwise, we'll return false. OK, let's try and code it up. <clears throat> so you got to dig deep here and remember uh, your string methods. So the way we'll get the first character is substring from index 0 to 1. The way we'll get the last character is substring 
starting at the last index, going all the way to the end. So remember, there's two versions of substring. Here, I just gave it the starting index, which is the last character. And then if I leave out the ending index, it goes all the way to the end of the string. And then for middle, I'll get substring starting in index one, ending at that last index. <clears throat> okay, so we've got first, last, and middle. Now I'll say if it's not true that first equals opening parenthesis, or if it's not true that last equals closing parenthesis, in either of those cases, I'll return false. Otherwise, I'm just gonna return the answer to the question, is the middle nested? <clears throat> That's a little bit different than what I said here. Here I said, if the middle is nested, return true. If the middle isn't nested, return false. But that's just the same thing as me saying, is the middle nested? If this returns true, I want my whole method to return true. If this returns false, I want my whole method to return false. So it's just a shorter way of doing that same thing. Okay, um, let's run it. Awesome. So you see, this it says recursion nested is running recursion nested, which is then running nested, which is running nested, which is running nested, which is running nested. So we seem to be inside this infinite loop. And the error message that you get when you have an infinite recursion is, oh, we're getting index out of bounds exception. Okay, because we kept chopping digits off, or we kept chopping characters off until the string was size zero. Um, if we were to keep going, the error message we would have seen is a uh, stack overflow exception. So if you ever see that, that's a sign you are in an infinite recursion. Okay, what did we forget? It's that same thing that starts with a B. We forgot the base case. So I'm gonna have, let, let me continue to do it a little bit wrong. Um, because like that's how programming is. We always do it a little bit wrong. Um, so. I'm thinking, what's the base case look like? I'm gonna keep chopping off pairs, beginning and ending pairs, until eventually uh, it's gonna equal a single pair. And in that case, I'll return true. You know what else it might look like, though? Um, if I see a single pair, I know it's true. But if I treated that as a recursive case also, it would get the first character, check it, the last character, check it, and it would get the middle, which is the empty string, and check it. So actually, I think I could use the empty string, and that would still work. Let's run it again. <coughs> okay, well, it seems like I'm still having problems here. Um, I wonder what's happening. Let's add a print statement that will show us what it's doing. will help us debug. So we're gonna check this one, and then we'll chop and chop and chop and chop and chop and chop and chop. Ah, once it starts getting smaller, it seems clear that it's not nested anymore. And so we keep chopping until we have a string that's length one. And so as soon as we reach a string length one, we know that it's failed. So maybe we need another base case that doesn't just return true. Let's have a base case that returns false. So if string.length equals one, we know right away it can't be nested, so we'll return false. Let's run it now. Okay, and now that's finally worked. Um, you might think that uh, we don't have to wait all the way until we get to one. If we have, like right away, we could know it was false if we knew that <coughs> it was an odd length string. So I'm gonna change the base case to say if the string is odd in length, then we'll return false. And I want you to notice that um, before I'd been saying that the base case is an input that's small enough, you can return the answer without calculating anything else. I've also been trying to say that a base case could be an input that's simple enough that you could return an answer without calculating anything. And so here, uh, the input isn't small, it's still got a lot of characters, but it's simple enough because there's a simple test I can run um, that would immediately tell me the answer without doing any calculations. Okay, uh, you've made it to the end of recursion day one. Let's summarize the big idea. 
the big idea is recursion is a problem solving technique where you solve your problem by combining small the solutions to smaller versions of the same kind of problem. So the way your method is always gonna work is you're going to assume that your method can magically give you correct solutions for inputs that are smaller than size n. Then you will use your own method to get those solutions. And then you'll use those solutions to create your size n solution and return it. So it will look something like this. Your base case, if n is small or simple enough, you'll return the answer you know. Otherwise, you'll run it with a part of n or some smaller piece of n to get your small solutions, and then you'll combine those solutions together somehow. And we saw that with nested like this. All right, uh, come back next time and we will do some more practice problems because it's gonna take you a week, maybe two weeks before this really starts to feel not super weird.